And thank you for having me here as well. As a millennial, as a 17-year-old, I don't have these experiences too often, but being here, listening to the conversations, it's inspirational uh, as, as a 17-year-old looking ahead. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll start with a little hook, and maybe you've seen this before, but I want you all to take two breaths. And I'm serious about this. So two deep breaths. OK, there we go. So you might not know that over 50% of the world's oxygen is formed by the ocean, by phytoplankton blooms. A lot of my work has been surrounding the ocean, and so this statistic is, is shocking for me, especially at a young age, realizing both the impact on personally or as, as a society, our sustainability, as, as well as the fact that over 3.5 billion people depend on the ocean as their primary food source. And so you can see through even just a health perspective, the importance of the ocean. And realizing this as a six-year-old at the time, uh, <laughs> uh, at, a, at a young age, I really I witnessed the devastation of an ocean ecosystem. This is actually Kaikili Reef off the west coast of Maui. And I saw that the coral ecosystem, the biodiversity, was degrading through my various excursions and trips out to the, the coral ecosystem. Uh, and this resulted in my investigation of the problem. And what I find very interesting is that what I discovered is actually exactly what's written in the problem statement on the brainstorming sheets, and that there was a lack of data, specifically in marine ecosystems, uh, to monitor, research, and also document these ecosystems. And so at a young age, I decided to try to do something about that, uh, specifically around data collection. Uh, and so I created a, a, a nonprofit organization, ReefQuest, uh, which is fostering marine environmental stewardship through citizen science, uh, but, and has reached over 60,000 students in 48 countries. But what we're doing is not only an educational platform, it's using research and data collection as the platform for education. And in doing so, sharing the data that is collected. And so a little bit uh, washed out, you might be able to see it. This is zooming into our field location, which, on, which is on West Maui. Kaikili Reef. And what's interesting to notice is all of the development surrounding uh, the, the ecosystem, and that is one of the leading causes of the devastation on this particular ecosystem. But what we'll see in a few minutes is that that dynamic was not apparent until that data was collected. And so what ReefQuest is doing is utilizing the power of citizen science. Uh, and so some of you might say, what is citizen science? Essentially, citizen science allows ordinary people like myself, untrained individuals to partake in actual marine research. And I, I said marine because that's our application, uh, but re really research in general. And the power of citizen science is that the data that's collected is scientifically rigorous and can be used in actual publications, in studies, uh, but can be collected from a much wider uh, base, essentially, the students, citizens. Uh, but as I started uh, de developing the program, you could see traditionally citizen science within the marine fields uh, essentially took a normal survey that scientists would conduct and made it easier so that people can go into the field, collect the data, uh, and then report out back to the scientists saying what they found. However, the difficulty that we found, especially within school settings, which is what's uh, listed here, uh, is that most schools, unlike the one pictured here, really can't go into the field. Uh, or won't go into the field due to liability reasons, even if they feasibly can make it into the environment. And so what I started wondering as a, a young person uh, was if we can't bring the ecosystem to the school, why don't we bring, or why can't we bring the school to the ecosystem, why don't we bring the ecosystem to the school? And so what ReefQuest has developed is uh, virtualizing those citizen science surveys. So now the development is that citizen scientists don't have to go into the field to collect this data. They can actually collect it online. But then the second issue in that problem uh, was how do we actually collect those data off of an ecosystem that is not digital? A lot of people know of metadata collection. What's nice about metadata collection is that that metadata is based on that, that website. What's different about citizen science in the marine field is that you have to then find a way to virtualize that marine ecosystem in a rigorous way, or a scientifically rigorous way, so that you don't lose any of the specificity of the actual ecosystem in the virtualization process. And so what needed to be done were, were two, twofold. One was uh, a development of a virtualization technology, which actually we uh, worked with Microsoft Research on. Uh, so that's a uh, coincidence. Uh, and then also, uh, 
virtualization of well-established citizen science surveys. And what that resulted in was both a platform to collect data, but also a platform to share the data. And so the citizen science data that's collected off of these virtual platforms, this is an example of one of them, it's called the Virtual Reef, and it uses a, a technology developed by Microsoft Research called Photosynth. Um, and essentially what it allows is for real ecosystems to be virtualized, and then the entire platform can be housed on a website for citizen scientists around the world to utilize. And so the process of virtualizing an ecosystem starts with Im image collection. And so as you can assume, the data isn't necessarily always on online. It, it doesn't start in that place. And so essentially what we have is a, a twofold participation uh, twofold participation in the program. The first starts with individuals who are willing to go into the field and collect this image-based data. And so this is where the data starts. And so the image collection uh, is essentially two to 200 photos that are collected in field. Which then moves to the uh, photosynth upload and processing, which is actually processed at a, a supercomputer at Microsoft Research called Sea Dragon, appropriately named. And it creates a point cloud, which essentially are, are multiple vectors which uh, position each picture in a three dimensional space. And having analyzed that point cloud, those pictures are then stitched together and implemented online. And you can see how through a very easy process, that data which would have otherwise been very difficult to collect has now been virtualized and can be collect, uh, can, the surveys can be conducted by anyone. And so essentially, the, the main point here is that it's ordinary people collecting the data using ordinary equipment with minimal training, and yet they're able to co can collect this extraordinary data and share it on the virtual platform. As a millennial, you probably all know that we have a problem with our cell phones. Uh, and so constantly looking at our technology, but there's a way to use that issue, we can say, uh, for the good of data collection in this sense. And so what does citizen science provide? From ReefQuest perspective, it provides two, two things. The first is research. And so uh, being an online platform, the ReefQuest website, uh, the Virtual Reef enables surveying at actual field locations, at, in actual ecosystems by ordinary people at an unprecedented rate. Uh, and then also data, data is analyzed uh, and further scientific understanding, uh, which is where the data sharing uh, comes in. And then documentation and education. So this data can also be used uh, to monitor and change, uh, monitor the changes and trends of a particular ecosystem and also provides a unique platform for STEM education. And so looking first at research, uh, how does ReefQuest approach this, this aspect? So this is an example of uh, one of our virtual reefs. Um, and I'm not showing the actual animation. This is a, a compilation of, of images. But essentially, you can see that what's required to have a, a digital scientific survey is essentially the same level of, of specificity and also detail that you would find in field. And so you can see here that you can get from the macroscopic view all the way down to the microscopic view and see actual individual polyps uh, in the virtual reef. Coral, which you might know is actually an animal, uh, not just the calcium carbonate structure. Polyps are the animal that produces the calcium carbonate structure. And so you can see how a virtual platform has been transformed using these technologies into a really uh, specific, rigorous scientific data collection mechanism. We then virtualize surveys, as I mentioned earlier, and an example of one of those surveys is the Coral Watch card. Uh, essentially, it quantifies coral health using coral color and hue. And so you can see how a, court, a, a card like this, which would otherwise require in-field activity, uh, is implemented on a, a, a technology like the Virtual Reef. And I guess I want to specify here that the Virtual Reef is an example of what this technology can provide or what this, this method can provide of, of online citizen science-based, uh, large-scale, crowdsourced uh, data collection. Uh, using this as an example, you can extrapolate the, the ramifications of, of such programs. The data that's then collected is automatically analyzed and published online. Being an online platform, this, that entire process can be automatically handled. And you can see uh, results such as this one. This is actually what we call a reef fingerprint of Kaikili Reef, which is our is ReefQuest main field site. And you can see how just with that citizen science data, we can 
actually determine health of the reef, percent coral cover, um, specific coral health by coral color. And so it's really a powerful tool having an online platform that's citizen science based. Moving on from research, the second component of citizen science is documentation and STEM education. And so to use a story to describe this, uh, when I first experienced the degradation of the ecosystem in Hawaii, it looked a lot like what you see on the left. That's actually a picture that I took off the coast of Maui. And what you might not realize is that that's actually all dead coral. Uh, while you still see the structures, the mounding structures, uh, it's actually entirely covered by algae. And what's interesting is that compares, compared to the picture on the right, which is a bleached coral ecosystem, this is usually caused by global effects, while as the uh, picture to the left is actually caused by a local uh, pollution issue in the specific environment. What was interesting as a seven-year-old in this environment is that we couldn't distinguish between the two without the necessary data and the necessary monitoring. Or like it says on our brainstorming sheets, there wasn't enough data, nor were there enough personnel to monitor and collect that data. And so without that data, we really weren't able to determine what the issue was, what the problem was in this environment. And without that understanding, we wouldn't have been able to make any change. Luckily, with ReefQuest support, as well as various research institutions in Hawaii, we were able to collect the data on this ecosystem and determine that it actually was not global warming or ocean acidification that was causing uh, the, the degradation on this reef. It was a local sewage treatment plant. So here image is the reef. And just north of that is a local sewage injection plant. The data that we were able to collect, both on the virtual means and in field, was able to actually determine that it wasn't bleaching that was causing the, the death of the reef. It was actually the overgrowth and smothering of the algae on, on the ecosystem, the natural occurring algae, caused by the, the addition of nutrient-rich water from the injection, injection wells. And that actually led to, the, to policy change. And so this is the Kaikili herbivore fisheries management area. Those are some of the actual scientists who worked on the data collection. And this is a, an image of the actual location. And what was powerful about this story is that you can see how the, the data collected off of a citizen science platform then informed the actual issues occurring in, in the ocean, which informed legislative change and now is protecting the ecosystem. But I, what is so impactful about this is that none of this really would have occurred without the data collection and the data sharing. Additionally, these platforms can be used as a new, new platform for STEM education. And so what I found is that student participation in research specifically allows for greater depth of study. So as a, as a student myself, if I'm really able to engage in the actual research occurring in field, I associate with that, I'm able to further my own understanding, but also the, the passion with which I approach the, the learning is enhanced and different. Uh, it integrates students in real research and a multidisciplinary approach uh, lead, leads to really deep understandings of the scientific approach. ReefQuest has two programs. One is for classrooms near ocean environments, and they, those we call mentor schools. And essentially, they run uh, year-long programs where they actually collect the virtual reef imagery in field, if they're able. Uh, and that is a multidisciplinary, a spiraling curriculum, and it uses the virtual reef, the citizen science data program, um, to end documentation protocols to further their STEM education. What's interesting there is that they are not the ones collecting the data, they're actually producing the platform for the data collection. And so you can see how that is also necessary before data collection. Um, classrooms far from the ocean then partner with those classrooms near the ocean uh, and actually use the, the platforms that the other classrooms have produced uh, to collect the data, which is then shared automatically off the digital platform to NOAA, or organizations like NOAA, um, EPA, NGOs like the Coral Reef Alliance, uh, and various other state and, and local uh, organizations and administrations. Uh, and then also the, the research and data-driven classroom environment stimulates analytical and uh, quantitative reasoning as well as uh, really experiential learning. And, and for me, that was what changed my understanding of the scientific world. And we're here at a, at a conference on data sharing and, and data collection. And so how does STEM education change that? Well. You, at least from my experience and talking from the scientific perspective, uh, 
scientists, and I, I think we can really all call ourselves scientists because we're looking at this data and we're trying to understand its ramifications on whether it's society or the, the world. It's training for that. And what's powerful about this site is that it uses that opportunity for training to uh, cap, uh, catalyze students and collect data through that, those means. An example of, of some of those educational-based platforms, here's one of the virtual reefs, using a technology already developed by Microsoft Research called Hotspots, and it's actually just uh, the ability to target particular locations, uh, asking questions, and actually training, uh, training people off of, a, off of a research platform. And so, in conclusion, main points of ReefQuest really is that uh, a virtual citizen science platform uses crowdsourced data to engage students in research. But what this also allows us for that data um, off of that very large base, the, that student base, which is global, to be shared with organizations who can then use that data. Being a small NGO grassroots organization, we don't have to worry with data sharing and, and privacy rules, at least yet. Uh, and what that has allowed is to create an open source platform that is not limited uh, in any respect. And so essentially, our data is then shared, uh, merging citizen science, data crowdsourcing, and uh, student-led research platforms through this educational uh, platform. And so essentially, when you're able to merge these three, you create this very compelling and innovative platform where by students who are still through going through the learning process can collect the data so that is, that's scientifically rigorous enough to be sent to actual organizations uh, for use uh, and, and can facilitate change. Thank you. Let me invite anyone who has any comments or questions, uh, Dylan, uh, to raise it at this point. Really interested in the public policy change that you helped to spur because I think a lot of times we discover that public policy is actually not driven by the best data. So we may have data about what works and what's effective, but getting it into that policy is the real challenge. So I would love it if you could tell us more about how you and your colleagues were able to do that. Yeah, I mean, the Hawaiian ecosystem, and I mean that both environmentally and also societally, is, is very unique because the natural environment is so important, really, to everything else. I mean, tourism being one key economy. And so the politicians, specifically the councilmen in the, the county of Maui, were both interested in, in the economically driven sides of, of the policy, and that was actually what was causing most, much, much of the problem. Uh, the sewage injection treatment plant um, actually turned off some of its uh, procedural uh, steps, uh, which was causing a heightened level of nutrient-rich water uh, to be injected into the environment. Um, once that was proven, though, that it was actually manifesting in, in negative effects on the ecosystem, that was compelling enough to change that the policy. And, and once that was able to once that was proven with the rigorous data, then it really wasn't uh, much of a problem from the policy side because they were willing to cooperate with that. Um, I think another key issue in data manifesting in political change is, is also the, the quantity of data uh, and, and the, uh, how it's applicable to that specific environment. Luckily, we were actually on the reef, and so we had the data that specifically correlated nutrient-rich wa uh, water, algae overgrowth, to reef degradation. Um, with a lot of other data sets, it's, a little bit, it's much more difficult because it's more obscure. It might also be somewhat distanced. Uh, you have maybe a case study that you have to apply to a different uh, environment. But that's, I think, where citizen science and crowdsourcing really comes in, because with citizen science and crowdsourcing, your environment is the globe. And you can, uh, especially on a digital platform like ReefQuest, you can exploit the people on the opposite side of the world to collect that data, and, and that data can then manifest in, in change. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, sir. <laughs> so you are explicitly collecting data about the planet. Mm -hmm. Implicitly, you're also collecting data about the activities of the citizen researchers that could tell you, you know, this person is bad at taking photographs, uh, this person has a cheap camera, this person, there are all these other kinds of things you can do. Um, is there anything you can do with that data about the users, ignoring privacy and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what's really powerful about that is even in our discussions at the, at the tables, we were saying, you know, I don't know what I don't know. And so we, there is all of this metadata, and, and it's possible to extrapolate very meaningful uh, results from that, from that data. Um, 
what results exactly, we don't necessarily know until we try it. Um, I think there is definitely an opportunity, though, for that, uh, especially on the ReefQuest website. Being a digital platform, you get all of those key pieces of information. Um, we were talking even uh, in, in the collaboration of, of Microsoft Research and various other organizations, uh, how could we take this metadata that would otherwise be looked at as trash and apply it to a different uh, application? And so th that, I think, is where I would approach it from. I don't know exactly how it could be used, but there's definitely that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? If not, once again, Dylan, thank you very much for the privilege. Thank you.